And welcome to the Hayward Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, this is Sabbath School today, number four, Faith and Healing. Shall we pray as we begin? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the precious lessons that these miracle stories that Jesus has left us that teach us about righteousness by faith. And we ask that you'll give us a heavenly discernment of the Spirit. In his name we pray. Amen. So yes, this lesson number four on faith and healing, there is an intimate connection between justification by faith and healing. And this was part of the most precious message, the connection between God's forgiveness and his healing power and growth in our lives. They are in harmony, in a beautiful marriage, and we're going to see that as we go along here. Well, have you ever wondered why God doesn't intervene to heal today more sick people miraculously. Yes, it's true that medical science does heal many, but does that mean that the great physician has uh, virtually abdicated his healing role to the medical profession? So we want to ask this question, could there be a different circumstance today than there was 2,000 years ago when Christ and his apostles did heal the sick? and cleanse the lepers, and give sight to the blind, and even raise the dead, and cast out demons. Well, here's our observations. We know this, that the message of the cross was more vividly proclaimed in the early church, and it resulted in a deeper conversion of folks. And number three, it made it safer for the Lord to work miracles, because the healed persons would not take the glory to themselves, but, be, but would be henceforth constrained by the love of Christ, who died for them and rose again. Ellen White says this, she reminds us in Ministry of Healing, page 227, often some form of vice is the cause of feebleness of mind or body. Should these persons gain the blessing of health, many of them would continue to pursue the same course of heedless transgression of God's natural and spiritual laws. In other words, we could say, why bother pumping up a tire that has holes in it? Nevertheless, we know that Christ is the same forever and ever, yesterday, today, and forever. And that means that Jesus still has compassion for the sick today. He doesn't like to see people suffer. He suffers with them. And therefore, we can only conclude that the most important ministry of healing is proclaiming the only message that can reconcile alienated hearts to God. It's the genuine grace of, of the gospel, unmixed without any element of paganism or Babylonian religion. We are told uh, in the Spirit of Prophecy and Great Controversy, page 612, that miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. The then she associates this with the rays of light that penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. A large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. The Lord's side. Now what could those rays of light be except the love of God that's seen in his people? One's mind staggers. Try to imagine the joy that will flow like a river when the Lord's pure good news goes forth in glory and power. How many human hearts now in darkness will meet Christ and find in him their soul's longing? That must mean that in that same final work, the pure true gospel will again be recovered and proclaimed. If the Lord can give us the grace to be humble in heart today, we can begin at least to recover that blessing, and that will be good news. Now the big if and that universal promise of drawing all, if, all, will draw, if I be lifted up, that big if meets its fulfillment in Revelation 14, verse 1. It's another angel that will finally come down from heaven having great power. And that's the drawing that will be uh, some people who are lifting up Christ on his cross as he has never been lifted up before. And to draw all does not mean necessarily that all will be one. 
All will sense his drawing, but not all will respond favorably. Many are going to resist and reject. Uh, there are precious ones who are to be called out of Babylon. And there is a compelling power that will move the honest in heart. And God will bring a restraint upon uh, unbelieving relatives and friends so that they will dare not nor find it possible to hinder those who feel that the work of God and the Spirit of God is upon them. The last call of God will be carried even to the most downtrodden of humanity. And signs and wonders will follow the believers. God will be in the work. And every saint, fearless of consequences, will follow the convictions of his own conscience. The gospel message will close with the power and the strength. Uh, and servants of God will be endowed with power from on high to declare the message, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, her gospel is anti-law and powerless and souls scattered everywhere are going to answer the call. And what will give power to the message? Lifting up Christ and him crucified in a clearer way than any movie or play acting or theater or pictures can portray him. So we ask, well, why hasn't Revelation 18 been fulfilled as yet? We can't lift up Christ crucified while we still are lifting up ourselves uncrucified. But the Holy Spirit has the so solution to that problem, and there's good news before us. Now, I just wonder what you think about the faith healing movements that are going on. There are people who claim to be given the special gift of faith healing so that they can lay hands on the sick and on, uh, so that they recover. And undeniably, there are miracles, they claim, that have happened. Well, faith is a key element in healing. And the Bible says, yes, faith is the key element in healing. But we need to understand what faith is. Because the Bible says that, quote, the devils believe also and tremble, James chapter 2 and verse 19. Now, maybe the story of the Roman centurion might help us to understand. You remember that he was a, a Gentile military officer, and he believed that Christ could just say the word, and his mortally sick servant would be healed. At the end of this story, in Matthew 8, verse 10, we say, it, Jesus marveled and said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Now, what was that faith that Jesus commented upon? The belief that Jesus had the power to heal by simply saying a word. Well, if you say yes to that, then you partially get yourself into trouble because the devils also believe that Jesus can heal by just saying a word. So, just such confidence comes a little bit short of a definition of genuine faith healing because the devils also have faith in God's word. They believe every word of the Bible. But as we read on in the story of this Gentile military officers, if we read the context, we begin to see that this soldier's faith was more than that, believing, more than just believing the word of God, having the power in it. Because it says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 8, that he had begun to understand his personal sinfulness in the light of Christ's righteousness. That's a key point. For he said two things in Matthew 8, verse 8. He said, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof, and neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. So he felt himself unrighteous, and he felt that Christ was worthy. In other words, that Christ was righteous. Now, the devils, do they have such feelings? of humility and grace. Uh, now we can begin to see that the centurion's faith was not just a mere mental trust, but it was a hard appreciation in the righteousness of Christ. Secondly, it was, he had an unusual love that had filled this Roman soldier's heart because he was concerned about his servant who was mortally ill, his slave. He was not concerned for himself. Matthew 8, verse 9. So, the faith that this centurion had had already transformed him 
and delivered him from self-centeredness. So he was concerned more about his servant. Now, is that the experience of devils? No, it isn't. And so this story does help us to understand the essential ingredient of all true miracle healing, that faith is a heart appreciation of the sacrifice of Christ, his righteousness. And as soon as I say that, I realize anew how weak and childish my little faith is and how much I need to grow. I wonder if you realize that too. Now we read in Matthew that Jesus had compassion on the multitudes and that he healed all of the sick. And sometimes after he left a whole, left these towns, whole villages, uh, were, had, which had been sick, whole villages, there was no sick person left in them. He healed everyone in the villages. Here's what it says in Matthew 9.36. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Again, Matthew emphasizes in chapter 14 and verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion toward men, and he healed their sick. He had a wonderful healing ministry, didn't he? Now that was 2,000 years ago. Now if we fast forward to our time, don't we too still have people who are sick and with all kinds of needs today? We too have compassion on them. But what can we do now to help them? Uh, obviously, not, nurses and doctors do a wonderful work of healing and relieving suffering in our communities. But what about us ordinary folks? Well, we can tell them New Covenant truth, can't we? New Covenant Truth. In some cases, simply doing that may bring physical healing to sufferers. Cross-reference the story of the paralytic who was let down through the roof into the presence of Jesus. All that poor sufferer needed to hear was for Jesus to tell him, Matthew 9, verse 2, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. These were the first words that Jesus spoke to the paralytic. And this man was happy. He was smiling. He was willing to endure sickness in the face of the peace that Jesus had given to him. If Jesus had never worked the miracle of healing upon him, he would have gone forth out of that home a happy man because he was in reconciliation with his God through the forgiveness of Jesus' sin, uh, forgiveness that he had from Jesus. Well, uh, we can share that good news with people, even though we are not versed in the healing arts. To say those words to someone flippantly or thoughtlessly, of course, doesn't do any good, but if by the grace of God we're able to tell the message thoughtfully and meaningfully, the Holy Spirit will bless to the healing of the soul. Even what we supposed Suppose in the holiest of saints is love for God and hope of heaven can be selfish in nature. Just as there is something selfish in pressing through the crowd to get a seat in the bus, which means that someone else has to stand or stay behind. And this conviction of inherent selfishness is so deep in our heart of hearts that it cannot be effaced. Thus spiritual peace is banished. Just as bodily healing must follow, not precede forgiveness. So doing what is just or showing constant love must follow and not precede forgiveness. The forgiveness must take away the sin, not merely excuse it as civilized courtesy prompts us to excuse inadvertent slips. Because God is love, he is too serious-minded to indulge in moral trivialities. God is not a millionaire handing out a rupee to a beggar, nor does he blink his eye condescendingly at our sins. The original word for forgiveness is aphesis, which means actually to take away the sin. You see, sin, it, sin is very serious because it brings pain. It brings suffering. It brings death. And what a father or a mother wants to see is his or her child. Uh, that's the last thing a mother and father want to see for a child is suffering and pain. 
And as surely as God is love, so surely does he want us to avoid the frightful wages of sin. Hence, he insists that forgiveness must not be superficial and temporary, but it is deep and eternal. And when Jesus healed our paralytic sufferer, he taught a truth that is backward from what humanity in general have thought is forgiveness. You see, our mistaken idea has been that one must make himself good before he can come to God and receive forgiveness. But that is backwards. Good works that are tainted with self-seeking spirit cannot produce a heart cleansing because the motive itself remains selfish. Do you see the point? The reason why Jesus could say to the sick man, your sins are forgiven, is that a divine sacrifice to cleanse away sin was about to be offered for all human beings. And in one sense, it already had been offered, for the book of Revelation presents Jesus as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world in Revelation 13, verse 8. So Jesus is the grand original which every animal sacrifice in every land and every culture has shadowed forth since the time began. His blood alone could ever suffice to take away sins. Thus, although the event of the cross took place historically 2,000 years ago, its power to affect forgiveness of sin has been timeless because the sacrifice was a divine sacrifice and not a human sacrifice. And forgiven sinners in ancient times look forward to the cross because their animal sacrifices were never intended to provide true forgiveness. The real meaning of both the Hebrew sacrifices was a confession of faith in the true sacrifice yet to come. Never since the world began has any human soul found release from the burden of guilt except through faith in that divine sacrifice. And from the beginning, God counted the divine lamb as already offered. The faith of millions looked beyond the animal's blood, which was a mere type to the divine antitype. So I want you to get the point here that forgiveness of sins precedes physical healing. And we'll come back to that in a moment. You know, we have an interesting American hymn, which is seldom sung. We sing the national anthem, but this is the American hymn, My Country Tis of Thee, you're familiar with. And the last stanza is very arresting. It says, Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. You know, our Heavenly Father says in Leviticus 25.10, You shall proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. You see, there's not an addict to alcohol or tobacco or harmful drugs throughout all the land of Israel. Every one of them was to be free. Liberty was to be proclaimed to the addict. And in the very proclamation of liberty, the freedom was to be realized. And that principle is expressed in Romans chapter 116, in the good news itself of liberty is the power of God unto salvation. There is power in the proclamation. So a leper came to Jesus in, Mark, in Matthew 8, verse 2, it's, it's, and said, If you are willing, imagine the leper addressing Jesus, If you are willing, be, uh, be cleansed. You can make me clean, he said. And this gave evidence that uh, Jesus, in his mind, was the divine Son of the Father of Liberty. And immediately Jesus responded in Matthew 8, 2 and 3, I am willing, be cleansed. And Matthew says immediately his leprosy was cleansed in verse 3. Now, of course, the leper didn't need to add that word if, for the Father is always willing, isn't he? He always wants the addict to be set free from her captivity. That can be set down as solid fact. Jesus did not ask the leper any questions first to see if he was worthy. Are you worthy to be cleansed of this leprosy? He didn't ask him that. 
He just accepted the poor man's request as it was, gladly, and healed him, unworthy as that man may have been. And he will accept your request for cleansing. It may be that you are to blame entirely for your sinfulness, for your addictions. But the Lord is not counting up debts on an account book, a bookkeeper. Jesus still uh, is doing what the scribes and the Pharisees accused him of doing. They said, this man receives sinners. Jesus is still doing that, folks. He receives sinners in Luke 15 too. The verb means he spreads out the red carpet for them and welcomes them like long lost brothers. This is what he does in receiving sinners. So let yourself be welcomed and received. Believe that he's willing to set you free from your addiction and believe that his word does it. Walk down that red carpet and thank him for delivering you and thank him now ahead of time. You may say, well, I am still a captive with an addiction. Well, the Lord welcomes you and receives you. Now, we want to link justification by faith in Christ's healings. What is the message of justification by faith which the Lord in his great mercy sent to Seventh-day Adventists? You know, this is a reference to the 1888 message there in uh, Testimonies to Ministers, pages 91 and 92. It, the sinner's faith is not what initiates a person's forgiveness. It's not what initiates his justification. Listen carefully. God initiated it when Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. God initiated our forgiveness when Jesus died upon the cross. And there he restored the whole race of men to favor with God in Christ. He has made all men accepted in the beloved. And as surely as a verdict of con condemnation came upon all men in Christ, since the, uh, in Adam, upon all men in Adam, so the verdict of acquittal came upon all men in Christ. Since the legal justification took place by the sacrifice of Christ as our second Adam, justification by faith therefore has to be far more than a legal declaration. It actually reconciles the believer's heart to God. And he cannot be reconciled to God and not at the same time be reconciled to his holy law. So you see the point here is that Christ actually rec reconciled all sinners legally to God by his sacrifice on the cross. So that when justification by faith occurs, when the sinner receives the gift of legal justification. It has to be more than something that's legal. In other words, it does reconcile the sinner's heart wholly to God. It does something within him. That's justification by faith. Therefore, justification, genuine justification by faith in this antitypical day of atonement makes the believer obedient to all the commandments of God and prepares him for translation. You see, we're not saved by Christ, by grace, through... We are, pardon me, we are saved by Christ, by grace, through faith, not of works. So faith does not initiate our forgiveness, our justification by faith, because that would make faith a work, wouldn't it? Faith would become a merit then. No, we are saved by Christ, by grace, through faith, not of works. Thus, instead of being motivated by either fear of hell or hope of reward, the believer is motivated by the love of Christ to live not unto self, but unto him. In this light, justification by faith is the only cure for our worldwide spiritual disease of lukewarmness. It's the only means to prepare a people for the coming of Christ. This is the beginning of the Christian life. It's receiving the life of God by faith. How is it continued? How is the Christian life continued? Just as it began. Just as it began. In Colossians 2 verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, that's how it began, so walk ye in him. That's how it continues. 
for the just shall live by faith. You see, the secret of living the Christian life is simply that of holding fast the life which received at the beginning forgives the sin. God forgives sin by taking it away. Taking it away. He justifies the ungodly by making him godly. He reconciles the rebel sinner to himself by taking away his rebellion and making him a loyal and law-abiding subject. But it's difficult to understand how we can have the life of God as an actual fact. It can't be real, for it is by faith that we have it. So, it was by faith that the poor palsied man received new life and strength. But was his strength any the less real? Was it not an actual fact that he received strength? Can't understand it? Of course not. For it was a manifestation of the love of God that passes knowledge. But we may believe it and realize the fact, and then we shall have an eternal life in which to study the wonder of it. Now this is, these are Wagner's words commenting on this healing. He says, read again and again the story of the healing of the palsied man and meditate upon it until it is a living reality to you. And then remember that these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by leaving you might have life through his name. Sometimes sick people need something more than medicine. A man sick of the palsy was one day brought to Jesus and his four friends had to break up the tile roof in order to lay him down at Jesus' feet. And the sufferer did not ask for anything, not even for healing. And when Jesus saw him, he recognized that he was suffering from guilt. And this is why he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And oh, how that poor man's face shone with happiness and peace. Now he was not afraid to die, for the awful burden that had been crushing out his life was lifted. But Jesus took another step. He commanded the sufferer to pick up his bed and walk away. Here is Matthew 9, 3 through 8. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. And when the multitudes saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Now do you see how Jesus, forgiving this man of his sins, act, actually reconciled this man's heart to God. It gave him peace with God so that when Jesus commanded him to take up his bed, he exercised faith and did what he was asked to do. In other words, justification by faith is manifested in obedience to all of God's commandments. <laughs> and so it's, it's a heart that was reconciled to God. One of the most common expressions to be heard among professed Christians when speaking of religious things is this. I can understand and believe that God will forgive sin, but it's hard for me to believe that he can keep me from sin. Such a person has yet to learn very much of what is meant by God's forgiving sins. Now I'm quoting from Wagner here. It's true that persons who talk that way do often have a measure of peace in believing that God has forgiven or does forgive their sins, but for failure to grasp the power of forgiveness, they deprive themselves of much blessing they might enjoy. The scribes did not believe, Wagner says, that Jesus could forgive sin. In order to show that he had power to forgive sins, he healed the palsied man. 
This miracle was wrought for the express purpose of illustrating the work of forgiving sin and demonstrating its power. Jesus said to the palsied man, Take, arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house, that they and we might know his power to forgive sin. Therefore the power exhibited in the healing of that man is the power bestowed in the forgiveness of sin. That's the bottom line that Wagner is breaking out. Justification by faith is the word of God to you. It is the power to heal you from sin and to continue growing in the sanctified life. So he says, note particularly that the effect of the words of Jesus continued after they were spoken. They made a change in the man, and that change was permanent. Even so, it must be in the forgiveness of sins. The common idea is that when God forgives sins, the change is in God himself, but not in the man. It is thought God finally ceases to hold anything against the one who has sinned. But this is to imply that God has a hardness against the man, which is not the case. He says this, God is not a man. God does not cherish enmity toward us, nor harbor a feeling of revenge. It is not because he has a hard feeling in his heart against a sinner that he forgives him, but because the sinner has something in his heart. God is all right. The man is all wrong. Therefore, God forgives the man that he also may be a right. And when Jesus, illustrating the forgiveness of sin, said to the man, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house, the man arose obedient to his voice. The power that was in the words of Jesus raised him up and made him well. That power remained in him, and it was in the strength that was given him in removing the palsy that he walked all the time to come, provided, of course, that he kept the faith. There, are, there is life in the words of God. The words that I speak unto you, said Jesus, John 6, verse 63, they are spirit and they are life. The word received in faith brings the Holy Spirit and the life of God to the soul. So, when the penitent soul hears the words, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee, and receives those words as for living words of the living God, he is a different man, because a new life has begun in him. It is the power of God's forgiveness, and that alone that keeps him from sin. If he continues in sin, after receiving pardon, it's because he has not grasped the fullness of the blessing that has been given him in the forgiveness of his sins. In the case before us, says Wagner, the man received new life. His palsied condition was simply the wasting away of natural life. He was partially dead. The words of Christ gave fresh life, but this new life that was given to his body and which enabled him to walk was but an illustration both to him and to the scribes of the unseen life of God which he had received in the words, Thy sins be forgiven thee, and which had made him a new creature in Christ. So we learn from this healing uh, story that there is real power accompanying the forgiveness of sins. That power is the power of the endless life by which Jesus is high priest. He puts his own life of righteousness into and upon all them that believe. And that sends away the old life of sin, which was death. When we forgive a person who has done wrong, it makes no difference in him. We are to forgive him, not for his benefit, but for our own. And if we refuse to forgive an offender, he's not injured by it, but we are. We forgive a person not to clear him from guilt, but to clear ourselves. Because if we refuse to forgive him, we take upon him, ourselves his sin and become responsible for it. But God forgives a person for the purpose of cleansing him of its guilt. God's forgiveness does not consist in empty words, 
but it makes the man perfectly free from sin. It does not consist in simply taking no account of the outward acts that the man has done, but it removes from him the sinful nature. It makes the sinner a partaker of the divine nature. And this divine nature is the life of God in Christ, so that with it comes healing of body to every man, one who can discern the life as it is manifested. There are folks who may despair a justified life. They may despair justification by faith and say that while it is very well to live such a life, um, there's a higher life. There's the sanctified life. Uh, holiness teachers say there is a victorious life or there is a higher life experience beyond being justified by faith. But to cast, these are uh, Wagner's words, there are those who disparage a justified life and say that while it is very well to live such a life, there is something far higher cast discredit upon the righteousness of God by which forgiveness comes. He says they simply do not know the power that there is and the redemption that is in Christ Jesus by which we are justified. True, many people live a sort of Christian life for years without knowing the real joy of freedom from sin. But that's not the fault of the justification which God imparts, but the fault of their own blindness. They have not known the gift of God in the forgiveness of sins. We have every gift that a gracious God can impart to a fallen race. And that, that's a key line in, in Wagner. In the forgiveness of sins, we have every gift that a gracious God can impart to a fallen race. Elsewhere he says, all that a man really needs is justification by faith to prepare him for the second coming of Jesus. So he's enfolding justification by faith and sanctification in union together there. The way we have come into a life with Christ through the forgiveness of sins is how we continue to walk in him. Finally, Matthew presents the story of, a, of demoniacs whom we can consider a would-be disciple. And this story differs from the others in that it establishes the motivation of the one seeking discipleship. In the region, uh, this, was, this is on the Sea of Galilee on the mountainous side to the east. And this fellow came out and these two demon-possessed men out of the tombs and screaming, just screaming at Jesus. It says that he could neither be bound nor be subdued, for he broke the chains and irons used to restrain him. He spent the nights and the days running among the tombs and on the mountains, howling and bruising himself with stones. He was a danger to himself and to others. According to Matthew, when this demoniac saw Jesus coming, he ran to him, fell on his knees before him, and he cried out, Matthew 8, 29, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the times? See, the, the evil spirits were speaking through him. Uh, the demons identified themselves as legion, for we are many. And they begged Jesus, send us into the pigs. And the pigs were feeding on the hillside. Jesus acceded to their request, and the demons went into the pigs. And then they ran to their death into the lake. And then the, when the townspeople heard about this incident, they came out to verify it. They saw the former demon-possessed man sitting quietly, dressed and in his right mind. The townspeople did not rejoice at the man's marvelous change, nor they, were they impressed by the miracle. They rather focused on their material loss in the pigs. Fearing that Jesus' presence would create greater losses, they asked him to leave their town. And this revealed something about their values and their attitudes toward uh, the just act that Christ had done for these demon-possessed men. And so Jesus heeded their request, and according to the Gospels, Jesus boarded the boat, and he, the healed demoniac came to Jesus and said, Can I go with you in the boat? And this action said 
that he didn't want to be just an ordinary disciple. He wanted to be a disciple who attached himself to Jesus. He wanted to go with him rather than one who accompanied Jesus. In other words, this healed demon-possessed man saw himself as a living example of the power of Jesus and felt that his witness could be convincing to others. Unlike the other would-be disciples, this one had a positive uh, experience with Jesus, which was his healing. However, as in the case of the others, Jesus did not respond favorably to his requests. And yet, unlike the others, this man did practice discipleship after his encounter with Jesus. Jesus didn't take him with him on the boat. But we read this about him in Mark 5.20. He went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis, which is south of Galilee there, ten, Decapolis means ten, ten towns. So he had quite an area of witness. How much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed, it says. So followers of Jesus proclaimed a message refreshingly different than much that is usually called gospel today. The original language implies that those who sense Christ's agape love find it impossible henceforth to go on living for self. We see the Savior's matchless love and the sight of him attracts and subdues our hearts and alienation and rebellion are healed. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for these, these miracle stories that teach us about righteousness by faith and the union of the new birth, justification by faith, conversion, with the sanctified growing life. Truly, your forgiveness of sins is the mainspring that continues to drive us as followers and disciples of Jesus. And we thank you and appreciate his great sacrifice in his name. Amen.